Uh, we are, um, we're, we're taking a slight detour this week uh, from our Reset series because it's unusual for a day like today for there to be a coincidence of um, our, our nation's birthday and a time of worship and also Doug Robertson's birthday, so, I mean, there's that. <laughs> Not to embarrass Doug or anything, but at any rate, it's just unusual. So we're going to take a little bit of, of a detour, and we're going to look at this question. Somebody else's birthday? Who's? Lydia? Who's? Oh, Jim. Hey, Jim. Great. Jim Lehmer's birthday as well. Anybody else got a birthday today? I mean, come on, right? Awesome. Well, happy birthday to both of you. Absolutely. And if anybody's watching online and it's your birthday, happy birthday to you. <laughs> America's throwing a big party tonight for you, so enjoy. Enjoy. Uh, but seriously, uh, one of the, the, the kind of the ongoing questions for people of faith, and not just of our generation, but for, for a long, I mean, ever since there have been people of faith, one of the perennial questions that, they, that we have to wrestle with is how do we relate to the cultural context in which we find ourselves? Because every season is different, every age is different, every people and ethnic group around the world finds itself in different cultural contexts and has to figure out a way, how do we live our, our faith and be faithful in that in the context of where we live and the value systems that, that, that we are confronted with? And, and that's not just true for our generation, but for many, many, many generations who've gone before us, including many of the ones cataloged in Scripture. And so we're going to kind of just think about just a little bit about that question because of, of where we find ourselves situated on this nexus kind of a day. And Jesus is wrestling with this question with some of his fellow Jews who put a lot of stock in their Jewishness, in their heritage and their nationalistic pride. And Jesus sort of wants to challenge them to, to critically examine some of that in light of their relationship to Yahweh. And so he's, there's a bit of an interchange and there's some pushback that these folks are giving Jesus about some of the things he's saying. So let's listen in a little bit to this interchange between Jesus and some of the, uh, the fellow Jews. Jesus said to the Jews, verse 31 of chapter 8, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, We are offspring of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, and yet you seek to kill me, because my words find no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. And that's where we're going to pause. We'll say a little bit more about their, their response is not a, a kind or gentler response. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> there continues to be this ongoing tension between Jesus and these folks because he's really challenging some of their assumptions. So let's listen in as the Holy Spirit tries to bring this to life for us this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for sending your son, Jesus, who was a, a Jew living in Israel at that particular time in history and in the context of that unique cultural situation. And he had to find a way to speak to his fellow Jews about how to live out their faith faithfully in the midst of that context. And honestly, God, we have to do the same thing. Ours is different. Our times are different. Our challenges are different. And yet the, the, the baseline remains the same, that as your covenantal faithful people, God, we have to understand how to live out our faith in the midst of a world and a, and a cultural context that at times lines up with the values of your kingdom and at times does not. So God, would you shepherd us through that? Lead us so that we can be a people who are faithful to you above all else. Because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The year was 1951, and the United States of America, indeed the globe, had just recently emerged from one of the greatest horror seasons of human history, the, the, the horrors of the Second World War. America found itself in that season in this sort of post-war boom. Uh, the economy was roaring back. 
Babies were being born. Some of you were born during that period, known as the baby boom, right? And, and babies were being born. Mainline churches were filled to capacity pews, and, 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 and Sunday school classrooms were filled with, with families from the greatest generation. And America was on the rise with unbridled prosperity. And in the midst of that, that kind of um, cultural experience, that's sort of the paradox of, on the one hand, having experienced the horrors of war and epic loss, and on the other hand, an incredible rising prosperity, faithful Christians were kind of caught in between. How do we relate to this culture? How, how do we understand our place in this and onto the stage of human history at that time strode a noted theologian and ethicist by the name of H. Richard Niebuhr. Niebuhr penned a book at that time that was so incredibly timely and helpful. You might be a little bit more familiar with uh, his brother Reinhold, who penned the, the, prayer, the prayer that's sometimes used in 12-step programs, the Serenity Prayer. Both these guys were, were very, in their day, well-known theologians and ethicists. Richard Niebuhr penned the work known as Christ and Culture, in which he seeks through this work to try to trace historically down through the ages of human history how people of faith have sought to relate to the cultural context in which they find themselves. And he noted that there are at least five different models, historically speaking, that people of faith have tried to live this out. I don't have to, it's a very dense work. It's an academic work if you've ever read it. It's really good, but it, 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 we don't have time to go into it, nor, nor would you have interest in going into all the details. So let me give you the executive summary. There are essentially five of them, five different models that he says kind of represent typically how people of faith. The, one is, the first one is Christ against culture. That is the viewpoint of a lot of very conservative, maybe fundamentalist, ascetic, monastic communities that see the culture as kind of evil and corrupt in its totality and want nothing to do with it and pull away from it. That's sort of on one end of the, the, the extreme of the spectrum. On the other is the Christ of culture. This is the, 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 the sort of the slant of the social gospel movement and the liberalism of the early 20th century. That's basically said everything more or less that's happening in culture is, is a good thing, is of God, and we should embrace it and bless it. And between those two extremes, Niebuhr said there are some there are three different models that are kind of nuances and variations on those themes. Christ above culture, Christ in paradox or in tension with culture where we're in the world and, but yet not of it, often one of the great proponents of that one was, was, a, was a guy, a little unknown guy by the name of Martin Luther. Might have heard of him. And then there's the last one, which is the one, the stream in which our tra tradition, our tribe as Reformed Presbyterian Christian stands, the, the Christ transforming culture. Uh, something advocated by Calvin and others who stood in that stream and said, we have a role to play as followers of Jesus to bring our faith to bear, to help bring about a transformation of culture. What Niebuhr was trying to do was sort of survey human history and distill down these basic models of how Christians, in this case, have sought to live out their faith in the context of a culture that sometimes supports that faith and sometimes opposes it, whose values at times line up with it and at other times just dissect from it. But interestingly enough, that challenge that Niebuhr kind of catalogs in his book was not new to the 20th century. Not even new to Christians. The people of God have been trying to figure this stuff out for millennia. In fact, when you read the Old Testament... <laughs> There are, from the earliest days of the Hebrew people, when God formed them, you see these warnings over and over again for the people of God not to commingle and syncretize their faith with the, with the value systems of the, the culture that they found themselves in. Many, many times throughout the Old Testament, whether it was the sort of the corrupt practices that were common in those days of child sacrifice or temple prostitution or, or charging exorbitant interest to your neighbors when you made a loan to them or unchecked nationalistic pride, or, or serving the local deities so that you would get a, a good harvest out of your crops. 
You see this over and over. Any of you who have studied the Old Testament, you'll, you can resonate with this. There's a, there's a constant refrain of God saying, be careful. Pay attention. Don't let your, 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 your passions and your priorities and the loyalties of your heart be rooted in anything other than an unrivaled commitment to Yahweh and His kingdom. And you see this over and over again. And ironically, when we get to the time of Jesus, you would think that having read that history, become familiar with the scriptures of the Old Testament, generation after generation, they would have gotten it. But when we get to the time of Jesus, Jesus, ironically, is challenging his own people because they had so commingled and conjoined their ethnic nationalistic identity with their commitment to God that they were kind of one and the same. And Jesus wants to, wants to insert a, a little dose of, of medicine reality, if you will, to say, that's not the way it works in the kingdom. And he challenges them. Look at verse 31. To the Jews who had believed him, because some of them were just writing him off, but he says to the ones who had believed him, if you hold to my teaching, then you are really my disciples. And then you will know the truth. And what? Truth will set you free, right? Now, if you read this in the context of John 8, these folks have been giving Jesus a fair amount of pushback about some of the stuff that he was saying. They were giving him a lot of opposition. Like, who does this guy think he is, right? Doesn't he realize we are the children of Abraham? We're the chosen people? Look at verse 33. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be free? Seriously, come on. We're Israelites. We are the people of the covenant. We are the inheritors of the promised land. Who do you think you are? I mean, that's basically their response. We are the people of God. You see, many of the folks in Jesus' day had so confused and conjoined and commingled their, their ethnic heritage with their vaunted status as the, the covenant of people of God. They were sort of, a, it was a one, one size fits all. It was an indivisible unity. God and country, one word, like no spaces in between. It was all together one thing. And Jesus calls that into question and says, that's not the way it works in the kingdom of God. Your heart, your loyalty, your passion, your commitment cannot be rivaled by any other system of this world or values or kingdoms that might try to lay claim to it. And he challenges them. And it's interestingly enough, I was thinking about this, it's a similar kind of dynamic that happens between Jesus and the, the Samaritan woman at, that he meets up at the well in John 4. She's of a different ethnic background. You remember the conversation they have? So I'll, it, I'll read it to you. John 4, 19 to 24. Sir, the woman said, I can see you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. And yet, don't miss this. And yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. She was caught up in this perennial question of which people group gets to lay claim to the status that we are the exceptional people of God. We have a VIP status in God's economy. And is it, is it you Jews or is it us Samaritans that get to lay claim to that? And Jesus says it's neither. He cuts through all of that kind of cultural mishmash and gets right to the heart of the matter because the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. 
and where the loyalties of our heart lie. And it is incumbent upon us as the faithful people of God to make sure that we keep guard over our hearts and we watch them with great vigilance and carefulness to not let anything usurp the place that is only and rightfully due Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords. Not any other competing ideology or ism, whether it's liberalism or conservatism, capitalism or communism, American exceptionalism or global universalism, whatever the ism is, it has no place at the top billing for the follower of Jesus and a son or a daughter of the Almighty God. Somebody say amen. amen. We are primarily, first and foremost, always till our last breath, citizens of the kingdom of God. That is our identity in Christ. That is who we are. And there is not God and country, Jesus plus something. It's God alone and His kingdom. It's Jesus alone as Lord of lords and King of kings, the sovereign of the universe. That's who gets our heart's loyalty and allegiance. As much as we may love and, and cherish the freedoms and the values and the culture that we live in, and we should, there's only one who is worthy of our highest devotion and loyalty and commitment. As the writer of the great hymn, Crown Him With Many Crowns, put it, Crown Him, the Lord of heaven, enthroned in worlds above. Crown Him, the King, to whom is given the wondrous name of love. Crown Him with many crowns, as thrones before Him fall. Crown Him, ye kings, with many crowns, for He is King of all. Crown Him, the Lord of lords, who over all doth reign, who once on earth the incarnate word for ransomed sinners slain, now lives in realms of light, where saints with angels sing their songs before Him day and night. Their God, Redeemer, their King. Crown Him, the Lord of years the potentate of time, creator of the rolling spheres, ineffably sublime. All hail, Redeemer hail, for thou hast died for me, and thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. Amen? Amen. Now let me be clear. Jesus was not anti-Israel. He loved his country. He loved his people. He cherished them. In fact, at one point, one of the gospel writers says as he's coming into Jerusalem and realizing how, how badly they were missing the, the heart of God, he just wept over his people. He loved them. He went to all of the national celebrations and holidays. If his hometown of Nazareth had had a functional equivalent to a 4th of July cookout barbecue and fireworks display in the town square at Nazareth, Jesus would have been there. And if they'd run out of wine, he would have made a beer run and fixed it, right? <laughs> I mean, that's what he did at the wedding at Cana. He loved to, to party, to sit down, enjoy a meal with friends. He loved a good celebration. And he was present in many of those kind of national gatherings to celebrate the, the, the identity of, of the people of God. And he saw the value in, in, in being who he was among those people at that point in time in history. He went to temple. He went to synagogue. He studied the Torah as a kid. And he said, this stuff is really important. In fact, in Matthew chapter 5, he says it very clearly. Do not think, verse 17, that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything's accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's more than just the outward appearance going through the motion. 
being a good citizen. It's taking a look, long, hard look at what's the quality of my heart? Where do my heart's loyalties lie? Jesus valued and honored his Jewishness. But he valued and honored the loyalty and allegiance to God and to his kingdom alone above everything else. Above any other competing ideology. No matter what it is. And I think that's a timely message for us. And not just because today's the 4th of July. I think it's a timely message for us always to wrestle with these issues. As we seek to be faithful people of God in our culture and in our time, to examine our heart's loyalties and passions and priorities. It's good for us. We love this. Many of us, I hope all of us do, love this country. Some of us because we were born here, and some of us because we came later in life to it. But there's a love for us, and because we love this country, we should celebrate all that is good and noble and true about her. Amen? There is much to celebrate. As Dan talked about in the, in the opening, there's so much to celebrate. I love a good fireworks show, except when they keep me up till 3 in the morning. But, what, <laughs> but that, that's, another, that's another matter altogether. But we're also people in following Christ who seek to be faithful to him, who believe that knowing the truth sets you free. And that that's the, that's the value that we cherish most, is the freedom we have in Christ. Amen? And as people who, who are people who value truth, not only can we celebrate and acknowledge the greatness of the, the vision and the founding of this great nation, we can also acknowledge that some of those folks who threw off the yoke of tyranny also enslaved others forcibly and drove native peoples from their homelands. That's part of the, the story. It's not our favorite part, but it is part of the story. And we can acknowledge that because we are a people who believe truth sets you free. And we live in a, in a moment where we're celebrating our independence. Amen? And that's good. But as the people of God, we boldly declare our dependence upon him for our freedom. Our nation declared its independence. We declare our dependence. It took us a while to get this graphic right. We kept writing Declaration of Independence. I'm like, no. It's a play on words. <laughs> we are declaring our dependence upon God so that we can be the people he's created and destined us to be, to be a light shining in the darkness, to be salt in a tasteless and decaying world, to be the people who, in Christ and by the power of his Holy Spirit, are seeking to help transform the culture to God's glory. To be those people who live their way into that vision, that original vision, that John Winthrop and others had when they, when they sailed across the Atlantic. And he cast that vision, preaching the sermon aboard the ship, from which the famous phrase is often lifted, America as a city on a hill. I don't know if you've ever read the sermon. It's worth reading. I'm going to close with a few lines from it this morning because Winthrop, I think, does an admirable job of casting a vision for what he and others saw as they traveled and eventually founded the Massachusetts Bay Colony. He's been warning them about staying true to God on this journey and what's going to happen if they get off course. And he ends his sermon this way. Thus stands the cause between God and us. We are entered into covenant with him for this work. We have taken out a commission. The Lord hath given us leave to draw our own articles. We have professed to enterprise these and those accounts upon those and those ends. And we have hereupon besought him of favor and blessing. Now, if the Lord shall please to hear us and bring us in peace to this place we desire, that he hath ratified this covenant and sealed our commission and will expect a strict performance of the articles contained in it. But if we neglect the observation of these articles, which are the ends we have propounded, 
and dissembling with our God shall fall, fail to embrace this present world and prosecute our carnal intentions, seeking great things for ourselves and our posterity, the Lord will surely break out in wrath against us and be revenged of such a people and make us know the price of the breach of such a covenant. Now, the only way to avoid this shipwreck and to provide for our posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. For this end, we must be knit together in this work as one man. We must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to abridge ourselves of our superfluities, <laughs> for the supply of others' necessities. We must uphold a familiar commerce together in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. We must delight in each other and make others' conditions our own. Rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and our community in the work as members of the same body. And so we shall keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And the Lord will be our God and will delight to dwell among us as his own people. And he'll command a blessing upon us all in our ways so that we shall see much more of his wisdom, power, goodness, and truth than we've formerly been acquainted with. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us when ten of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemies, when he shall make us a praise and glory that others shall say of succeeding colonies, may the Lord make it like New England. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill, the eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword among the nations. And we shall open the mouths of the enemies to speak evil of the ways of God, and all professors for, sake, for God's sake. We will shame the faces of many of God's worthy servants, and cause their prayers to be turned into curses upon us, till we be consumed out of the good land whither we are going." And to close this discourse with the exhortation of Moses, that faithful servant of the Lord, in his last farewell to Israel in Deuteronomy 30. Beloved, there is now set before us life and death, good and evil. In that we are commanded this day to love our Lord our God, to love one another, and to walk in his ways and keep his commandments and his ordinances and his laws, the articles of our covenant with him, that we may live and be multiplied, and that the Lord may, our God may bless us in the land whither we are going. But if our hearts shall turn away, so that we will not obey, but shall be seduced and worship other gods, our pleasure and our prophets, and serve them, it is propounded unto us this day we shall surely perish out of the good land whither we are passing over. Therefore, let us choose life, that we and our seed may live, by obeying his voice and cleaving to him, for he is our life and our prosperity. Those were words spoken aboard a ship with a group of Puritan folk trying to find a way to worship and serve God in freedom. It was a vision that John Winthrop, who eventually went on to become the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, cast before those on that ship. A vision which in part was realized and in other parts they never fully realized. But as noble as that vision is, it doesn't even begin to compare <laughs> to the vision of the Lord for us and for our salvation. For God so loved the world, you and me, all of it, that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's the hope with which we come to this table. It's not that we come because we are somehow worthy or have achieved a certain status as the covenantal people of God, as a privileged people. We're a blessed people. We're a forgiven people. People who seek to walk in humility before the Lord. And we come at his invitation. None of us has earned a spot at his table. We get it because he's gracious, merciful, so as we come to his table, we remember that on the night of his betrayal and arrest, our Lord took bread, 
And after giving thanks to the Father for it, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. So take and eat of it, all of you. And when you do, remember me. And in a similar fashion, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, poured out and sealed in my blood which is shed for the forgiveness of your sins. So take and drink of it, all of you. And when you do, remember me. Remember how much I love you. You see, my friends, every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's life, death, and resurrection until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let's take a moment and be nourished at his table. Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom Lift your eyes to Jesus There is freedom Showers of mercy and grace 
Let's pray. Father, thank you for feeding us here at your table. Thank you for welcoming us into your loving embrace as daughters and sons. Thank you for giving us the gift of freedom, the ultimate freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. And God, we are truly thankful to live in a land where we can be free to worship, to gather like this. God, as we enter into this day of remembrance and celebration of this nation's freedom and independence, Open our eyes. Help us to see the people around us, Lord, some of whom may still be in bondage, who need to experience the ultimate freedom in Christ. Help us to to live our way into the, the vision you have for us as the people of God, to be light and salt. May your blessing not just rest upon us, but flow through us so that we are blessed to be a blessing. So send us out with that blessing, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. May our good, good Father lift up his beautiful countenance upon you and give you peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.